Hello, and welcome to the Lyman Lipke Guitar Cast. It's been a little while, uh, and we're back. And for those of you who are audio only, there's something different. I'm on YouTube. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, th this podcast is being filmed. You can see me. I'm moving my hands around, and y'all audio only people cannot see that. But if you watch it on YouTube, you can. Um, it's nice to be back. Um, I, I desperately want to give YouTube a proper shot. I have been threatening to make educational YouTube content since 2009. Um, I, I, I've always been a big fan and a big proponent of, of YouTube as a uh, teaching and learning platform. Um, and I'll, I'll tell a little bit of a story. Um, many years ago, when I was learning how to play the upright bass, let's see, upright bass right there, um, I, I, I didn't have a teacher. I, I had joined my high school jazz band, and I needed to um, figure out how to play the upright bass. This was in 2006. There wasn't a lot of stuff out there on the internet yet. Um, now, now, if you search up upright bass on YouTube, you get thousands and thousands of videos that you can look at. Um, but back in the day, there were there were like two things on YouTube. One, uh, an old Ray Brown master class that he did, I think, in 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 the UK, um, and I watched that probably a hundred times, trying to figure out what was going on there. And the other thing was there was one guy making uh, educational upright bass content on YouTube. Uh, at the time, he went by Basius, and now he goes by uh, Dr. Basius because uh, he got his uh, DMA in, in the bass. So he's a, he's a bass doctor. Uh, and his name is Denson. Uh, so I've, I've been watching him for, for a long time. And crazy, uh, he found me on TikTok, and, and we've gotten to to connect. So I've I've gotten to actually share gratitude with uh, essentially the, my my first upright bass teacher, who had no idea he was teaching me. Uh, so that's been super cool. It's like the the advent of of social media, and that that's sort of the first thing I want to talk about is is just. Social media, YouTube, those uh, things of that nature, because, like I said, I've been I've been threatening to make YouTube videos for a very very long time, um, and, and somebody left a comment on one of my Instagram uh, posts, the the one announcing my YouTube channel. What uh, what took you so long? Two things: fear and laziness. Uh, Probably more the the second than the first. Um, I, I I've seen a, a ton of YouTubers blow up and and, and crash. Uh, so I I like to think like I I I've watched enough YouTube to understand. Um, that is my wife sneezing in the background. I don't know if you could hear that, but. There it is again. Bless you. Uh, I've watched enough YouTube to, I think, understand uh, some some pitfalls and some things that I can try to do to try to grow a uh, successful channel. And consistent content is is number one. Like, it, I, f I feel like if you're not posting consistently, you have no shot. Like. Uh, or a very little shot. I mean, you can make something. Maybe it goes viral, but that—that's. Uh, I don't want to roll the dice. Slow incremental growth is what I'm after. Uh, and another thing I wanted to talk about is just success in general. Like, what what does success on the internet and and in music? What does that mean? Like. From a certain point of view, my point of view, I'm incredibly successful. Like, 
also from a certain point of view, anybody who makes any money at all playing music is incredibly successful. This is a hard racket. It, like if if you're if you're if you're not losing money playing music, like you've done something right, or you've gotten incredibly lucky, um, or you've worked really really hard. Um, you know the the uh, the old adage: uh, luck equals preparation plus opportunity. So prepare for those spots, and when the opportunity comes along, uh, hopefully, you know, you've prepared yourself sufficiently. Like, I, I'm very, very fortunate that, that there are any people at all that, that are interested in listening to what I, what I have to say. I've garnered a following on, on TikTok of quarter million people following on Instagram of over 100,000 people. And if I could get a fraction of that on YouTube, I'd be really happy. As, as far as, you know, monetary success, I guess it's a struggle. <laughs> like, uh, being a working musician, being a teacher, like, you, you don't get into this to make money. Like, I, I I always thought when I when I would see people who had like you know twenty thousand subscribers or fifty thousand followers on you know some social media app like wow they must be getting their their social media checks uh, well I've been waiting for mine like um, the monetization is uh, is nowhere near where I thought it was that's that's fine maybe I maybe I'm doing something wrong maybe I'm not. Uh, correctly monetizing but the only thing i want to focus on is just consistent growth um making you know videos and, and pieces of content that hopefully resonate with people and, and that people would maybe want to share that with, with with their friends and you know growth comes from there so that's sort of my, my thought on you know, social media and success and uh, what, what, what any of that, that means. So let's talk about the plan. The plan here is for uh, this podcast. I plan on doing two a week. One, just sitting down, chatting with you like this. And uh, a second one, questions and answers. So if you have any questions... Anything you want me to talk about, leave them in the comment section below. Send me a DM on Instagram. Um, I'll probably get a phone number at some point where you can call in and we can make this like a call-in show. <laughs> Listen to your messages and uh, answer your questions. But that, uh, I feel like that's that's a way I can consistently make content for for YouTube. Do a couple of these a week in addition to some long form lessons like i say long form in, in quotes my first youtube video that i i posted that has a thumbnail and everything uh was just, just six minutes just on ideas on how you can create lines uh, but but i've got tons of these small little ideas i guess this is my uh, setting my intention for all you uh, if i if you say something out loud it becomes real so i hopefully will be held accountable because i've said all this stuff out loud so two podcasts a week one general talk one questions and answers um, and i'll probably pull from uh, you know other videos as well like the comment sections from other videos comments i receive on instagram because a lot of you have real good questions. And also a lot of you have really terrible questions. <laughs> what I mean by that is you're, the question you're asking requires um, quite a bit of prerequisite knowledge. Uh, and if you ask a question in the manner that you're asking, like... It, 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 
the, oftentimes these questions are asked in a way that, that I can sort of tell that the, the prerequisite knowledge isn't there. Like, um, the an, uh, a question I get all the time is like, what scale is that? Well, uh, I, I always give the, the, the Joykov answer, uh, which is it's the, the, the major scale or the chromatic scale. You can do a lot with the major scale. Like, um, that was all major scale except for that one mistake note that I played. That's like a blues scale note. Um, nothing fancy, just some, some, uh, skips scales and thirds uh, so some sequences call these one two three fours you play it in reverse four three two one nothing outside nothing outside that's all the major scale and, and applying that to changes as well, like a two five one in the key of C, like with with no outside notes. It's already starting to sound a little bit like like jazz, and we haven't even introduced chromaticism so so let it's less of what scale am i using it's more uh how do you use scales in general uh, patterns patterns are, are, are it's, it's a way to get ideas just under your fingers scales and thirds those sequences uh, but once we start adding chromaticism within that scale framework, that's where we really get into the, the, the jazz sound. So here's something really cool. I can just put a chromatic, I can descend a scale. Um, I call that the fourth position of C major, three notes per string. But before every note, I can put a uh, chromatic tone below. syndrome going on um, and that happens to every single one of my students um, like I, I know they're capable of, of playing the exercise that, that I've laid them out uh, to play but as soon as that camera comes on like all, all of a sudden 50% of your, your uh, abilities just go right out the window but um, the idea I can put a chromatic tone below any tone in the major scale. And, and that's, that's a start. Getting a start with chromaticism. Uh, with, without much brain power or, or even much hand power. I mean, like, talking about the fingering, one thing we can do is use the same finger that we would use um, if we're playing the position. So I've got my fourth finger on this B, so I can slide up my fourth finger on the B flat up to the B. The finger I'd use for this A note would be my second finger. So I can grab the A flat with my second finger. I could grab this G note with my first finger, so four, 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 two, two, one, one. And, and you know, you can always use the finger below as well. Um, it's 
useful to use that that sort of slide same finger on the the lowest note on a string. So it's the lowest note on the E string, lowest note on the B string. So I play that three, four, two, three, one. Now we now we're in interesting territory, and, and th this is probably easier for for the YouTube crowd to to see. I have a couple of options. So these are the B string and the E string uh, in the fourth position of, of C major. So the first finger goes here. I, I try to keep the fingers where they're supposed to be um, in the position. But crossing the B string always gives us some problems. So uh, on the E string, I could finger three, four, two, three, one, one. And then moving to the, the B string, three, four, two, three, one, one. And now my finger's where it's supposed to be, here, uh, on this string, in this position. However, if, if I want to put the finger that's supposed to be on the C, um, the highest note on the, the third string, things get a little bit cramped. So what I, an option that I have, that D note with my second finger and that puts my fourth finger where it's supposed to be on the third string. And then when you, you get to the strings tuned in fourths, it, the, if you do it across all seven positions, the, the pattern um, the, the patterns overlap. First four, four positions, you, you get most of the information that you need. And you get all the, the, well not all, but most of the information that you need. Um, to, to play uh, the, the strings tuned in fourths. So, what I, what I preach is, like, always pay more attention when you're crossing the, uh, the, the third string to the B string. Uh, because, um, you don't want to be caught with your pants down when you're making those, those crosses. So if you put a little, in a little bit extra time at the beginning, you, it'll it'll save you time in the long run when you're running through entire positions. So that that went off on a tangent. Um, what what's fr from the question? What scale are you using? Um, there, there's all sorts of different factors and different information that um, like well the scale is this, but. But using the scale, you can do this, and to do this, you need to do this, and the fingerings go like this. Uh, so basics, like getting the basics down of the guitar is incredibly important. If, if you want to, you know, be a complete guitar player. And, and that's, a, that's an entirely different ballgame. Like, uh, what do you want with the guitar? Do you want to be a super shredder? Uh, well, the basics are probably going to help with that. Uh, do you want to have fun and play play music with a, with a couple of your work buddies? You, I I mean, like, do you really need the basics? Who's to say? That's that's up to you to decide. 
And that's also a very important question, figuring out what you want out of this. That's something that uh, I, I'm, I'm constantly preaching, is figuring out what you want to do from with the guitar and what you want out of the guitar. That's going to determine the things you practice. Like, if you just want to play cover songs, like... Just learn the cover songs. There's, there's tons and tons of tab on the internet. You know. Uh, if you want to write music, uh, music theory is always helpful. But if you have a couple shapes that you really like and a capo, I mean, you might be able to write all the music that you hear and you feel, which is fine. Uh, it, it's It's when... You feel like there's something missing in your playing. Like, I wish I could do that. Or, I, I want this sound here, but I don't know how to grab it. That's where, like, okay. I mean, you could ask somebody for advice. Like, what should I do here? They just tell you, you put your fingers there. And um, that's fine. Like, or you could, you could take the endeavor of, of learning the basics, learning where, where where everything is on the guitar, learning uh, basic music theory. Uh, but that's is, is it worth it to you? That, that's that's only up to you to decide. Um, back on the, the the social media thing, I have never mimed anything. And that's something like I'm always a little bit afraid to ask some of my uh, you know, friends that I've made. Like, what is mimed and what isn't? Um, I got I got a buddy who is a big proponent of just like miming things for for co for uh, your cover um, stuff. Like, if you're covering a song, like record it and then mime it. I mean, to my reasoning on what, why I do what I do is twofold. I want what I play when I'm recording to be the thing you hear. Is that, is that super, super important? I don't know. It's important to me. And that's the, that's, that's the crux of it. Like, I want the thing that my hands are doing to be the audio that you hear. And two... Laziness. I don't want to record something once and then have to pretend to play it. Like, that, that's two things. Uh, when I'd rather just do, do one thing. If I'm having trouble with that one thing, guess what? I found something that I need to practice. Like, if I'm trying to shoot a video of playing this, this thing and I just can't play the thing, I have not practiced the thing enough. So I gotta practice that thing. And usually practicing it will help me in some other areas. And the the question, what should I practice, is, is another one of those questions that, that needs a, it's like, well, I need more information. Like, what what's hard for you? Like, are you, are you, are you trying to make a video and, and re re record your playing and, and keep screwing it up? That's the thing you should practice. You could you could go even even further from there. What are the concepts that that are involved in what you're trying to play? Then you can practice those concepts. Um, I I recently uh, made a comment on a, a, a prolific social media bass player's uh, Instagram post. Saying, and I did not mean to, you know, call anybody out about this, like, um, and, I, and I wasn't accusing him of, of, of anything. Like, I, I know this dude can play super, super well, but he played so cleanly, and, and the, the signal chain, like, there, there must have been, like, some good compression on it. It sounded so clean, to me it sounded like it was almost MIDI. And, and then there was a, there, there's a thread be below my comment that, arguing on whether it's it's been mimed or not. I, I don't think it's been mimed, but I, I don't know. 
I've, I've only been accused of miming something once. And I think that's because my playing isn't pristine enough to, you know, be accused of, of miming. And, and, and the thing that, that I was accused of miming, like, the... the it, it, it wasn't all that... that it wasn't good. <laughs> it, it was good enough. Uh, I was playing chord melody on fretless guitar. If I was going to mime that... I, w I would have, um, you know, recorded it pristinely, make, make sure that I got everything in tune. Um, and, and I mean, the, the intonation wasn't perfect, because it's very, very hard to get chords perfectly in tune on the fretless guitar. But, I, I mean, like, I did like three or four takes of it, and uh, just picked the best one. Just cut that part out and made the video. Um, but it, it's 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 interesting to be accused of miming. Uh, like, wow, I didn't know I played that good. Um, doing a solo podcast is tough. Bill Bill Burr is a master of it. I mean, at, at this point, I'm just I'm, I'm rambling on. Uh, <laughs> That was a tune that I played uh, that, that I was accused of miming on the fretless guitar. So, um, just just backing up even even further, the reason I'm doing this this podcast on video is it's YouTube content, and it, it can keep it uh, relatively uncut. Editing is my my least favorite thing to do. I hate editing videos. Um. So, hopefully I don't trip up over my words too bad. One thing like the the big guitar thing that I wanted to talk about today was one of those basic things that, that I will never stop preaching. I'm always going to keep preaching this thing. Positional awareness. I, I I've probably already talked about this on on another one of my my the podcast episodes. <laughs> uh, I'm a I'm a three note per string player. Uh, and it's not because I think three notes per string is, is the superior positioning system. It's the, the, the caged system, or the five fingerings, always confused me. Because sometimes there are shifts, sometimes there are two notes on a string, and, and, and most of all, like... I, I just can't for the life of me remember what chord, what open chord shape these uh, positions correspond to. Like, I, I just forget. Um. See, I, I sort of know the five fingerings. <laughs> But I, I know these very, very well. I know them in my sleep. And I like these because for me, like it's, it's decreasing the, the variables. The same number of things is happening on each string. One, two, three. 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 And there's only three shapes. Whole step, whole step. Half step, whole step. Whole step, half step. Um, so just putting those three shapes together. I never go um, up and then back down, like like in this position of caged. I'm shifting my first finger. My first finger is anchored on the fifth fret. I'm shifting it to fourth fret and then back to fifth fret. Um, and that's. Uh, I mean, that takes brain power for me to remember that. I suppose, you know, if you practice it, 
ten thousand times that like you're supposed to practice anything, like that just becomes part of your muscle memory. You don't think about it anymore. Um, when, I, when I was really diving deep on the the major scale positions, like I was trying to minimize the amount that I was thinking, and and that really helped with me. Like three notes on every string, like just. I know that that is the what I call the fourth position because we're starting on the fourth degree of C. Um, I know this fingering goes to this fingering, and, and that's applicable across string sets. So I'm at the second fret of the A string, B, C, D, E, F, G. That same, I call that a formational pair, occurs in the seventh position, starting on B. B, C, D, G, E, uh, B, C, D, E, F, G. So I'm at the seventh fret of the high E string. Back to the second fret of the E, A string. And for your the, the audio only folks, you can sort of hear the timbral difference more pronounced fundamental here, more high frequency information here. And, and that is like, it's like deep, deep uh, ideas. Picking the correct place on the guitar to get the timbre that you want. So when, when people say tone is in the fingers, that's one of the things I also like like to think about like where I'm physically playing the, the the passage on the guitar do I want it to be bright do I want it to be a little bit more dark I can get that um, a little bit by changing my hand position like playing closer to the bridge um, playing closer to the the uh, neck and for the audio only, that was reversed. So the dark one I was playing closer to the bridge. And then the, the bright one I was playing closer to the neck. And they're still tonally different. Um, how, how important is this stuff? Again, that, that's up to you to decide. Um, but positional awareness, like being able to play at first the C major scale, all the notes in the C major scale, no matter where you are on the fingerboard. Because a lot of times guitar players, like they, they know one, two, that really happen in maybe three fingerings, just they know those back to front, but the guitar player slides and the fingering and their, their finger is, is on a fret that's not in a, a usual fingering of theirs, a lot of times they're completely lost. So that, that's where having that, that positional awareness, uh, no matter where you are on the fingerboard, you're not, you're not lost. And you can do it from essentially the first fret to the 12th fret. It gets you all the positions. And then the, the fingerings repeat. Same fingering, an octave up. There are some things you have to account for, like the finger spacing. Like, ha exactly half as, as much. So the spacing between uh, the, the 12th fret, or the 13th fret, and the 17th fret, it's like very, very close to the 1st fret and the 4th fret. Again, other things to think about. Something that I was doing for a little while, but I have not been doing much as of late, because 
I haven't been favoring this guitar. It's the formational pairs on the uh, seventh string and the sixth string. Because as jazz musicians, the standard seven string tuning is E standard with a low A. Or normal guitar players would call that drop A. Um, so I, I have to account for a, a shift in any of my formational pairs. So I'm one, two, one, three, five uh, frets, fret numbers on the low E string, and then three, five, seven on the low A string. Shift back three five seven three five seven. And that's that's good stuff to know. Usually, like I, I'm not gonna play lead lines with this string because I'll be getting in the way of a bass player. You don't want to get in the bass player's way. That's how you get things thrown at you. I'm speaking from experience on both sides. I've been on the, the, the pitching end and the catching end. But... Uh, I'm convinced that, that this is the thing that, that will take an intermediate guitarist to the next level. To, from intermediate to advanced. Just knowing where everything is, not being lost on the fingerboard. So pick a system, three notes per string, caged. I, I think there are other positions as well, uh, positioning systems. But whatever one works for you. Um, a lot of my exercises that I give my students um, are within the three note per string framework. And, and, and if a student comes to me and says, I, I know caged really, really well. Like, cool. Then transfer the, the three note per string idea with the exercise to your caged position. Um, and and I, I wasn't sure if that, you know, the, the students were, were just having trouble with that because um, they, you know, it's a, a hard conversion to make. And, and then I got a student who really, really knew the caged system and, he, and, and music theory and where all the notes were on the guitar. So he was able to make that conversion like that. He, he understood the concept and then put it into his fingering system. So, if you're having trouble taking these three note per string ideas and putting them into your own fingering system, maybe you should make absolutely certain that you know your fingering system very, very well. Um, <laughs> Jimmy Bruno, my, my hero, he's got... Um, a, a video on, you know, he calls it the five fingerings. He gets mad if anybody calls it the caged system. He's like, play me the fingering. Ah. He's like, you don't know. Ah, well, I know it. You don't know it. You can't play it. He, he said that, you know, much more, with, with, with more color on it, in, in his language. Like, the, these systems, these positions have to be automatic. Uh, you cannot devote any brain power to them. It has to. I I, I use the uh, the analogy of like you know your brain being CPU and, and your muscles being RAM. Like that stuff has to be uh, relegated to delegated to RAM. So there are all sorts of stuff that we you got to use a CPU for, like chord changes. Um, 
making making sh- sure that we're playing with the other musicians, playing by yourself, keeping time, like. And I mean, part of that can be relegated, delegated to RAM. What's the correct word? Relegate, delegate. I don't know. And uh, so, so as far as the the positioning goes, I, I like to start with C, because there's no sharps, no flats. We can play the alphabet game. So F G A B C D E F G A B C D E F G A B G A B C D E F G A B C D E F G A B C. Literally saying the alphabet where it corresponds with your starting note, your starting letter. F G A B C D E F G A B C D E F G A B. Gotta do that. 10,000 times, maybe not 10,000 times, but a thousand times, you know, you put your finger down here, that has something to do with the letter G. And uh, my wife is being loud on the phone, so I'm going to play over her talking. Positioning system, like a pianist would have to learn one fingering for for C major, but that same fingering is um, comparable, like it's the same across all of the octaves. But if they played a, a a D flat major scale, they would have to play a completely different fingering when on the guitar. All we have to do is this. However, like the fingering changes as we're in different spots of the neck. So we, we have different fingerings in different positions. Like that's one way to play C major. We also have this way. We also have this way. So rather than learning all 12 keys to start, I would recommend uh, learning your positions, learning the C major scale in all positions, and then we can start to put things in different keys. Like looking at the difference between F major and C major, like what's the difference? All the B's are flat. So find the B in this position of C major. There's one. down a half step, keep everything else the same, we have the F major scale, which happens to be in the first position, because we're starting on F, so we've practiced that fingering already right here. We've just moved it to the first fret. And you know, you could go like all uh, throughout, in reverse order on the circle of fifths. Um, in that position, but rather than doing that to learn all 12 keys, go in reverse order on the circle of fifths from the same starting note. So, um, starting like on the f- in the fourth position, so I'm in E major starting on A. Now I'll be in A starting on A, first position. Now I'll be on. Uh, in the key of D, starting on A. Fifth position. Second position, starting on A. Uh, which is the key of G. Uh, sixth position, starting on A. Key of C. Uh, uh, third position, starting on A. Which is the key of F. Seventh position starting on A, which is the key of B flat. And we can continue key of A flat starting or key of E flat starting on A flat. That's the fourth position again. A flat. 
flat, starting on A flat, etc., etc., etc. That's how you can get comfortable with like how keys, um, how different keys are, are are found in this the same spot. So those are some of the the biggest uh, things that I, I I will preach, like positional playing, and, and knowing how to play in any key, no matter where you are on the fingerboard, like I, right here. Key of D flat. Happens to be the sixth position. Um, I, I, you know, I wasn't calculating too too hard. I just knew that if I put my first finger here, that's a B flat, and um, I know that B flat is contained in the key of D flat. Also know that it's the sixth, so I can just play my sixth position. Say I want to play in the key of E. I just moved from this B flat up to B, and then played in the fifth position. That, that, that would get me E, because B is the fifth of E. Learn that. If you can do that, you are golden. Uh, you, you are in the advanced territory as far as I'm concerned. All right, that's an episode. That's the first episode. Leave your questions in the comments. Let me know, uh, if, and I will address some of that in the uh, in the question and a answer portion of this uh, this podcast. Uh, I've got lessons available. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm always looking to fill my my calendar. Uh, you can find more information there at LimeAndLipkey.com. I've also got group lessons available. They're three dollars right now, but they may be going up in the future once we start getting more more traction there. So get in on it right now while it's uh, while it's cheaper. Um, please subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, or follow this podcast if you're an audio only listener. Um, follow it on Spotify or anywhere that you get a, your your podcasts, and uh, please uh, share with a friend. Because I would, I, I would love to see this thing grow more, and uh, it's more fun when there are more people around. But thanks for watching or listening, and I will see you on the next one. Practice. <laughs>